Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, we are ready to start. A warm welcome to this 12th annual uh, FIA Day, as we call it. Welcome on behalf of the Finnish Institute of International Affairs. This is an uh, annual tradition uh, to organize a special annual seminar for our partners and stakeholders on a topical theme. Many of you know that we do organize uh, plenty of seminars uh, on, on different topics, but this annual FIA Day celebration is a, is a special one, and it's also followed by a, by a reception directly after, after the event. Uh, this year's event will focus on European politics. We are heading towards European elections to be organized in, in May, and these elections seem to be particularly interesting and important due to reasons which we will soon get back to with our excellent speakers. Only roughly one month after the European elections in late May, Finland will start its third presidency of the European Union, the presidency of the EU Council, and for the second time already uh, in this kind of an interface between the EU's institutional cycles, as we tend to call them, when there is, after the elections, uh, no political commission and uh, the, a new one to be uh, take office only later on during the Finnish presidency. So we will have to, to rule uh, the, the council without a political government at the European level, and at the same time, we are like, likely to have a very fresh government in our own country after our own parliamentary elections, which will take place the 14th of April. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, at the Finnish Institute of International Affairs, we have now reached the final year of the newest three-year three research program at, at FIA. Uh, the past year, uh, was another very active year. We published all in all seven FIA reports. That's, that's the book format of our, our in-house publications. Uh, four academic books and a good number of shorter publications. Uh, all in all, 60 publications in our in-house publication series, uh, series and, and uh, some two dozen in, 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 in peer-reviewed uh, format in scientific journals or books. But what is uh, uh, even more important uh, is that, that our publications were, were found uh, by broader and broader audiences because the overall number of downloads of our in-house publications from last year was, was uh, over 40,000. So over 40,000 times someone downloaded or was, or was reading one of our in-house publications which is uh, 10,000 more than during the previous year. So FIA has clearly established its role as a producer of reliable topical analysis of world politics, also internationally. We are constantly found by new audiences, and, and it seems that during the past few years, our publications have, have reached new and new international audiences in many European countries, but also in the US and India for, for instance, if we look at the numbers from last year. The topics that our researchers uh, covered last year reflect the current shape of international politics. The great power constellation formed a common topic for, for our three research programs. Uh, in many publications, we were analyzing the relations between China and the US, US and Russia, and Russia and China. We tried to figure out uh, the factors that affected their international behavior and how their changing relationships would influence the so-called liberal world order with its institutions and norms. How the order of the world would change in the decades to come. Last year, uh, we also produced uh, a number of high-level or, or there were a number of high-level international book, book projects carried out at the Institute. Uh, 
with uh, topics uh, all from covering topics all from political narratives in the Middle East to, to politics and economy in the post-Soviet space. What comes to the study of the European Union, which is also a key topic at, at FIA, we studied how the EU manage, manages with the changing international environment. But also, more and more, we focused on the EU's internal cohesion and the policies of its key member states. Ladies and gentlemen, the Finnish Institute of International Affairs is mainly funded by, by this house, so the Finnish parliament, uh, but uh, our external uh, research funding, which comes from Finnish and international sources, has been gradually increasing, and last year we reached a record level in, in that respect. This means that we have been more and more successful in competitions for, for Finnish and international research funding. This external funding comes from, from uh, ministries in Finland, uh, EU Commission and also private foundations. And it has to be uh, pointed out that we also received last year an extension to our funding uh, on, on um, a multi-annual funding on, on US policy, policy and the global role of the US. This funding comes from the the, the Chain and Artos, Artos Erko Foundation, and, this, and with this funding uh, we will be able to, to continue with our uh, exchange program and many other activities, so we are, are really thankful, thankful for that. Uh, we also uh, received our first Horizon 2020 funding last year from the EU Commission for a project dealing with differentiated integration and in this uh, context, we are, of course, part of an international team. Ladies and gentlemen, as I have pointed out in many, many times, these results do not emerge out of nothing. They, they result from hard work at the Institute. So I want, again, to express my, my gratitude, first of all, to all of my colleagues at the Institute for hard work done. Our researchers do an excellent work and, and uh, our researchers are supported by a solid and hard-working administration. So I'm happy to, to look at our, our performance, which is, which is very good, and thank, uh, thank all my, my colleagues for that. But also I would like to thank uh, our good partners in the parliament, ministries, embassies, other research institutes, and in the civil society. It has been another year of very good cooperation and partnership with all of you. Uh, thanks also to the EU institutions for your support and, and uh, cooperation. And from EU institutions, we will now move to the topic of, 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 of today, uh, to, to the political landscape in the EU in uh, 2019. Uh, and the, the best person to, to, uh, to start to launch that topic will be the chairperson of our executive board, State Secretary Kari Halonen, uh, who will take the floor now, and after, after uh, State Secretary Halonen, I will then introduce our, our three international speakers. Kare, please, the floor is yours. Thank you, Teja. And good afternoon to everybody. Nice to have so you here, not so numerous. And also, on behalf of the board, I would like to welcome you to this 12th annual FIA Day. But I will also use this opportunity to comment briefly on the subject of the day, the political changes in, in the EU. I will make three remarks having the point of the Finnish presidency. The first one is that uh, our presidency will start in less than four months, and we don't know how many member states there will be when we start. Brexit is perhaps the most striking example of domestic policies which affect the European Union, and also the situation where we are now, four months before the Finnish presidency. The second remark relates to the uh, elections 
and other, other appointments we will have. I think never we have had a situation that, uh, if you look at the Finnish presidency these six months, that just before the presidency starts, there will be the elections of uh, the European Parliament, and then after that, the new commission will be formed. Later in the year, a new president for the European Council will start his or her mandate. And in addition, there will be also a new president for the European Central Bank. And if you add up that the presidency, the rotating presidency of the Council will have its elections in March, so it means that pr practically all the institutions are changing during these six or seven months. And this certainly will have an effect on the working of the whole union, but also the, the situation where Finland will has, have its, its presidency. And the last remark concerns uh, substance. There will be plenty of issues on the table during the Finnish presidency. Many of those issues are such that they have already and they will have an impact both on the EU policy and the domestic policies. Just one example. Migration, that has been three years now a su subject which has uh, deeply influenced the national policies and also the elections in member states and the attempts to form governments after the elections. But uh, vice versa, there is also issues in the domestic policies which have a strong influence on EU politics. Perhaps the most striking example is rule of law, the non-respect of rule of law, which has meant that uh, these kind of issues which uh, earlier were never discussed, debated, dealt with at the EU level are now in many forms the subject of, of union's work. And I think all these three remarks indicate how topical the issue of, of today's debate will be. And I wish you all interesting discussions. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be back in Helsinki. Thank you for the invitation, for the opportunity to come here, even if only this time for a few hours. Um, the, the topic of today's conference is transforming the political landscape. Um, and the main point I want to make is, is it is that it's actually the relationship between the transformation that is taking place in politics and the European Union that explains to a large extent uh, many of the underlying problems that the European Union faces, but also the difficulty that the European Union has in addressing those problems. So that if we don't understand what is happening in terms of politics in Europe more broadly, we won't be able to address uh, the challenges that the European Union itself faces. In order to start by making this broader point, I have to take you back in time, and a long period in time, to the birth of politics. Uh, there's a book by an Italian-American archaeologist that's called The Birth of Politics, that identifies, and many other uh, archaeologists and historians uh, support that, the birth of politics with the Mesopotamian civilization. So we're not talking about the birth of democracy, I'm talking about the birth of politics. You can have politics without having democracy, as we all know. Unfortunately, but that is the case. Uh, so the birth of politics is uh, connected to the Mesopotamian civilization for two reasons. The first, because that was the first urban area, that is, the first settlement where people were sharing a territory and therefore, and therefore a series of common resources without being part of the same family or the same tribe. So they couldn't solve the conflicts that emerged from the needs 
of allocating those common resources or from the social conflicts resulting from sharing that com same territory by using simply the natural uh, rules that will follow from being from the family or, or the tribe. And so they developed new forms and new procedures to resolve those conflicts, and that's the birth of politics. But the second reason why it is associated with that, it's because it also coincided in Mesopotamian civilization, the emergence of language as a functional instrument. Therefore, language not simply as a recognition element, but language as something that by being functionalized could then be taught and therefore could be learned by others and used by a broader group of people. So there's two lessons that follow from this, and this is uh, what I want to make, uh, my first point I want to make. Uh, the two lessons that follow from this historical example relating to the birth of politics is that politics results from interdependence in a context of diversity, from the need to resolve social conflicts where you no longer had the rules of the family or the tribe. So therefore it was difference associated with the consequences of that interdependence that led to the creation of politics. And the second thing is that politics requires a common language. That is, it requires something to allow collective, rational deliberation. So the difficulty that we have today and the challenge that we have today is that we the space of interdependence that we increasingly have is a space of interdependence that goes beyond our states. And therefore, it creates the need for politics beyond our states. It creates the need for politics at the European level where we are interdependent in many respects and in some areas even beyond Europe. But on the other hand, identity is what makes politics easier, but we don't have that identity. So we have a space for interdependence that requires politics while at the same time don't having the identity that makes the emergence of forms of politics easier. That's the first difficulty and challenge that we have. And the second one is that the transformation of politics on a variety of ways that is taking place, including the media that is used for politics, the disappearance of the tradition of sources of authority that I call the editors of democracy, from traditional media to political parties to trade unions. All this is eroding the traditional mechanisms for collective rational deliberation in democracy. And we haven't found new ones to replace them. And therefore, this is also making it harder for us to deal with this. It is those, these two challenges that explain the difficulties both that the European Union faces, but also how they interact with the difficulties that increasingly national democracies are facing. It is not uh, that the European democratic deficit results from lack of democratic input or forms of, uh, of democratic legitimation, from the lack of responsiveness, as it is often said that the European Union doesn't respond to what citizens need and want, in fact, the problem is that citizens in Europe, in many respects, want different things on matters that go from migration to the euro on how to address the euro crisis. And the problem is not that the union is not responsive to that, doesn't know that. The problem is that Europe doesn't have the political instruments to be able to reconcile those divergent interests, those different positions. That is the real difficulty that, 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 that we face. It's not that we do not know what citizens want, that we cannot uh, uh, answer to, to, to them. It is the fact that simply they want different things and we don't have the political forms at European level to reconcile those divergent interests in a variety of themes. Now, a first aspect uh, and a first reason to explain this has to do with the mismatch between the space where policies are required, that is, the space where we are interdependent on a variety of areas, from migration to taxation policy, for, for example, and the space where politics takes place that continues to be profoundly national. This mismatch, this gap between these two different levels, has two consequences that create a negative, a vicious circle, if you want. The first one is that this mismatch 
allows, makes very difficult and challenges the traditional mechanisms of accountability and attributing political responsibility. You don't know easily who is responsible for what in a variety of, poli of policy areas. And as a consequence, this facilitates for political actors at national level to manipulate this gap in their favor. It then has as, as a secondary consequence that this manipulation at domestic level of this gap between where policies are, taking, are necessary and politics takes place leads to often the wrong political incentives being given to national leaders that then have to reconcile those different interests at the European level. And because they have wrong political incentives, it makes the reconciliation very difficult and therefore makes the union very often ineffective. That is, national political spaces have not internalized the consequences of this interdependence and therefore this leads both to political manipulation at domestic level, but also then to a subsequent ineffectiveness at the European Union level. And is this that explains that we often, as citizens in general, talk about the European Union in a kind of paradoxical way because the Union is, if you think about it, presented, presented often as both oppressive and ineffective at the same time, as imperialist and incapable of doing anything, what is contradictory. I often say it reminds me this joke of Woody Allen in, honey, in the Honey Hole movement, movie where two characters complain of how bad the food is in a restaurant terrible food, we never eaten that this badly, it's the worst food we've ever had, and then they conclude, and the portions are so small. And this is a little bit the same way that we talk about the European Union. It's paradoxical, and the paradox comes from this difficulty with the nature of its politics and how it interacts with national politics. And this what explains why it is so difficult for the Union to reach conclusions to be effective in addressing its key challenges. It's not hard for us, and some of them have just been mentioned, to identify the list of topics on the agenda that we have to decide, from Brexit to euro area reform to refugees and migration to the multi-annual financial framework to security and defense. We all know very well, but in all of this, it seems that we are incapable of deciding, that we are incapable of reconciling our different interests, our different preferences. Now, so I think that the crucial thing that we need to start discussing is how can we create the conditions to have a form of politics at European level that allow us to reconcile our different interests on, this, on, on the variety of these topics. How can we do that? And I think in order to do it, we have to address three different types of challenges. The first one regards what should the European Union do and how to do it. The second one is the challenge of disintegration linked to things such as Brexit or fragmentation from within that has to do with increased erosions to fundamental and common values of the European Union or uh, deviations even from EU law. And the third challenge has to do on how to change. I won't be able to address this last one that has to do with the, this inextricable question that is Many believe that the Union needs to undergo some fundamental transformations, but at the same time we say we cannot do, even think about it because it's impossible to do any other treaty amendment. Uh, I cannot go into the, that problem, but I will address very briefly the first two types of challenges. So the first one has to do with what and how to do it. One thing seems clear to me, to a large extent the Union, and this, uh, this is related to what kind of narrative can we develop for European integration that uh, is able to support, to gather support from European citizens with respect to the process of European integration? I think that to a large extent what the narrative that worked for many years that the Union was and still is a basis for peace in Europe and for economic prosperity is in crisis. Partly because we take for granted peace in Europe Perhaps we shouldn't, and there are increasing signs that we shouldn't, but we do. And the other because recent years have not been years of economic convergence and, and strong economic pr uh, prosperity. So the question is how, what kind of new narrative? And I think the narrative 
that then defines what the Union should do has to do and should be that how can the European Union help the citizens of its member states regain democratic control and forms to guarantee social justice in an interdependent world. And for example, in terms of what this means for what the Union should do, for what should be the policy agenda of the European Union, this will mean that we should focus, for example, on three types of areas where its added value will be clear. The first one is regulating externalities between states on areas that go, for example, from environmental domain to the social domain. The second one is where can the European Union help each member state gaining scale where that scale is necessary in the international domain, in matters that goes from uh, uh, trade to security, for example. And the third one is how can the European Union help regulate transnational processes that by themselves member states can no longer do. Uh, I always give an example that is a kind, kind of counterintuitive example, but that is football. Uh, football, many of you don't know, it's a particular uh, interest of mine, Football represents 3.7, this is according to a report of the European Commission, 3.7% of the European Union GDP, or sports in general, the economic activities that is generated by sports, 3.7%. Uh, if you think that agriculture that we discuss so much represents 1.5%, you have a, an idea of how important it is. Yet sports is a totally unregulated area and that no state individually can regulate because if any, if Finland will try to regulate sports, what will happen is that its teams, for example, will be excluded by International Olympic Committee or by FIFA from its competitions. And that's why the only entities that this international sports body have always respected have been the European Union because they cannot exclude 27 member states at the same time. So it's an example of an area where actually the European Union reinstates public sovereignty, state sovereignty in processes that are no longer controllable individual by member states. But this is a small example, but there are others in the digital domain, for example, big digi digital companies, we see that now. You can only regulate those entities if you do it at the supranational level through the European Union, not at the national level. The second thing, it is how to do it. So if we identify these areas as, as the ones where the union can have added value, how to do it? And this has to do, how to do it has a strong impact on how the European Union communicates with citizens. You can go ahead and do as many advertising communication campaigns as you want. The main way through which a political entity communicates with citizens is how its policies are organized. So if you, for example, just to give one example, if you organize the funding of the European Union through budget transfers from national budgets, you are creating a zero-sum logic between member states. It's as simply as that. That's the logic you promote. If instead you detach the funding of the European Union from national budget transfers and you make it on own resources that, for example, result from taxation of digital companies as it it, has, it is being discussed now, and I propose already in a report in 2012 to the European Parliament. If you do, if you do that, it's totally, totally different than the logic that you create with citizens. And we did a poll with YouGov that tested this. Very interesting poll. We asked citizens in a uh, sample, a representative sample in 10 dem the member states, one first question. It was, do you think your member state should get more money and the European Union less money, or the European Union should get more money and your member state less money? And mostly you had Northern European countries, with the exception of Germany, curiously, saying more money for my member state with less money to the European Union. And in Southern member states, the opposite, as you might expect, because some believe that they are net contributors and or net, or net beneficiaries. Interestingly, Germany was in favor of more money for the European Union, less money to its member states, even for a small margin. But the interesting thing is that then we asked them totally different question. Are you in favor, and we made four different questions for four different new own resources. Are you in favor of a European tax on digital companies? More than 70% in all the member states in favor. Are you in favor of a tax on financial transactions, 
A majority in all member states, I think Finland was actually the one with the lowest majority in favor of the taxation on, on, fi on financial transactions, but even in Finland, there was a majority in favor. Uh, a European tax, that was said. Same thing for CO2. So depending on how you present it, on how you organize it, you have totally different answers on the part of citizens. Now, uh, the second type of challenges, and I, I know I'm reaching the limit of my time, the second type of challenges that I think we need to address have to do with the challenges of disintegration and fragmentation. As I say, this has to do with the possible consequences of Brexit, uh, and if Brexit will create or not. Increasingly, the understanding is that, in fact, Brexit has not led to a domino effect, but on the contrary, has led to reinforce the core uh, of the European Union with the other member states, uh, the cohesion between the other member states. But the second aspect is not disintegration, but it is fragmentation from within. When you have the same member states, but increasingly you have member states evading from, in particular, common and fundamental values of the European Union and the issues and the debates surrounding the rule of law in several member states raise this question. So what should we do in this respect? And I think we need to do two things at the same time. The first one, we need to reinforce protection of the core fundamental values of the European Union, including uh, the internal market law, but also its core fundamental values of Article 2, while at the same time creating instruments to diffuse some tension by giving some breathing room to centrifugal forces. How? First, by having in place effective mechanisms to protect the core, and I think they are slowly being developed, and more than Article 7, I believe that what's going to play that role is hard law again, and we see with the cases that are before the European Court of Justice, the role that the European Court of Justice is playing again. In the end, in the European Union, when we always want to achieve something effectively, we go back to hard law and to the core of the acquis of the EU law. Maybe I say this because I'm a lawyer, uh, uh, and it doesn't mean that I think that law provides all the solutions, and particularly not in this case, and it will certainly create some tensions too in some of these member states. But what we're seeing is that recourse is being had to those mechanisms and the court increasingly playing an active, uh, active role. But then the second thing we need to do is to create mechanisms for differentiated integration. Uh, uh, we have those already, but I think uh, uh, we need to fine tune them. And I think maybe the time has come to really think about two different and clear levels of integration. And I would like to conclude by uh, pointing that actually Brexit might be the opportunity for us to do that. So what we have, when Brexit happened, I, I said that uh, 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 it will not be impossible for Brexit in the end not to happen for one simple reason. The same political conditions that may lead to the Brexit vote are the same political dynamics internal to the UK that make it impossible for them to agree on an alternative to remain. Uh, and that's what we see. The, the reality is that there's no majority for anything, for any of the solutions. And Brexit gained because it was a false decision. It made a zero-sum decision out of a complex decision, because the decision was not whether to stay or to leave, the decision is, is what kind of relation does the UK wants to have with the European Union? And that the referendum didn't, didn't offer. And now, what we're seeing is the incapacity to find an alternative because there's no majority for any of these alternatives. Um, so, one possibility that I want to put on the table is that at a certain point we might reach to a situation where the UK might, the best solution for the UK might be what some call an EEA plus custom union, a Norway plus custom, customs union regime. Uh, and my argument it would be that that should be the case, but actually in that instance offering to those states a voice in the, in the decision making process of the internal market. And this will basically create two forms and two levels of integration in the European Union. Only one focusing only on internal market and customs union, but the difference with respect to EA is, is customs unions, but also voice in the decision making. 
and the other one for all the member states that will want more than market in integration. This will have to be done while preserving legal and judicial order integrity and the acquis, in particular the, the internal market. And second aspect, that will be the other challenge that we'll have to face, is how to then deal with the externalities between these two levels of integration. And that will be, I would say, the hardest question that we will have in, that, in, in such a context. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Taya, for this kind invitation uh, to celebrate with you your 12th annual day. It's a great pleasure to be here. Um, I realize that this is yet another time that I'm in Helsinki discussing the European Parliament's election. So from now on, I think you will have to invite me every, every time the elections uh, take place. Um, I will try to be brief uh, to leave us um, a lot of time for discussion. Uh, Taya asked me to focus on the uh, European Parliament's elections and I would like to walk you through two political trends that I think will define the forthcoming elections to the European Parliament. Um, I will also try to project, because it seems to me you might be interested in that, what kind of the European Parliament we will deal with in the aftermath of the elections. So the first point I wanted to make is that the political affiliation of post-industrial societies is becoming much more difficult to define. And if you look into the differences between center, ideological differences between center right and certain left, they've become uh, in, in recent years more and more blurred. And in a way you could also argue that the idea of uh, sort of traditional parties based on either faith or class is becoming in the, for the post-industrial societies less and less relevant. People don't vote any longer their entire lifetime for the same parties. They opt to vote for different, very often new political movements which come and go, but at a certain time in a given moment they offer them a response, sometimes a very uh, shallow one, to the concerns they have. And the very next day those citizens uh, might also vote for someone else. Now, you might ask how this phenomenon uh, translates into the European Parliament elections. Well, I think that belatedly we see that uh, also happening that translates into the public support for the European uh, political parties. Well, mainstream political parties, European People's Party, but also Party of European Socialists, they are losing their traditional uh, voting base. And uh, this has been pretty remarkable for quite a while, but if you follow the uh, most recent um, European Parliament's projections, you will see that both the EPP but also Party of European Socialists will not only lose uh, seats, uh, but they all together will for the first time lose the parliamentary sort of majority that they enjoyed for quite for quite a while. And uh, it seems to me that again also on this European scale, voters feel much more attracted by new political movements. Um, some of them are uh, pretty radical, but not all of them are anti-Europeans. And that's also the point which I think we should um, reinforce here today. Then the second uh, political trend which I think might be relevant for the current uh, campaign to the European Parliament elections is that the time of the permissive consensus about the direction of travel for the European project are not only gone in old member states, but also in newer member states. And uh, in Poland, the country which I happen to know the best, uh, the public uh, is still very much in favor of Poland's membership in the EU, but it is becoming more and more divided on certain policies. So if you ask, for example, Poles whether they like the current EU migration policy, they will be split. Whether, if you ask them whether they think it's right for the European Union to interfere into something 
that many of them actually think is a domestic issue, that is the reform of the judiciary, they will be also divided. Now, that leaves the room and opens a possibility, makes those societies vulnerable to the Eurosceptic uh, uh, Euro forces, and in a way also makes the EU the issue uh, in the domestic debate. Um, now, again, that has implications for the European Parliament elections, because for the first time, it seems to me, ever since I started uh, following European politics, Europe might for a change feature in the forthcoming elections. You probably know you followed already numerous elections to the European Parliament in your own country, and very often candidates used to debate or promise issues that they you had nothing to do about. Now we will still have more or less <laughs> the same uh, the same behaviour taking place this time round, but the EU will be used by um, by some uh, some political movements. Now. That, in a way, uh, benefits Eurosceptic movements. And you might ask why. Well, simply because they are much better at campaigning uh, on, on European issues than the traditional mainstream uh, uh, political parties. Well, mainstream political parties, and I will be very happy to hear more how, how, whether this is the case in Finland, uh, they use the uh, European Parliament elections as second order elections. And they very often spend less time and less money on those elections. Whereas for Eurosceptic parties, European Parliament elections are very often the only possibility to mark, uh, to mark their voice on or to mark their presence on, uh, in, the deba in, in the debate. And just to give you an example of the country I also happen to know pretty well because I've lived there for a number of years, uh, is the UK. If you look into UKIP, UKIP basically has no chance to get uh, seats in the uh, British Parliament, right? Um, uh, but when it comes to the European Parliament election, the proportional system very much favors UKIP and uh, uh, it manages to send uh, one of the biggest uh, delegation to the European Parliament uh, elections. So, um, in a way, the fact that the EU will be debated this time around is benefiting Eurosceptics, and also that's what is projected by the polls. Um, public opinion polls show that Eurosceptic will probably gain seats from around and sort of all together uh, um, uh, will, uh, uh, will have around 28% uh, or con constitute 28% of the European, people, uh, European Parliament's makeup. Now, one of the things that Eurosceptics also do better than mainstream parties is that they are much better at doing their homework than traditional uh, political parties, be it the EPP or Party of European Socialists. Well, the, Europe, the European Eurosceptics have actually realized that they can't really win voters by simply banging on Europe and advocating their country's membership, uh, advocating their country's departure from, from the EU. In fact, in the aftermath of the Brexit referendum, you know, the, the poll which was conducted in numerous member states uh, showed that actually the majority of the public supports their country's membership in the EU. But this doesn't mean that people do not have concerns about the European project and its individual policies, particularly when it has something to do with their sense of identity. <laughs> and this is now the target of the Eurosceptic uh, uh, forces. So they focus on those, on those policies. And here I very, uh, I very often refer to the example of the Swedish Democrats, which ahead of, we briefly discussed it beforehand, ahead of the parliamentary elections in, the, in, in Sweden, actually shifted away from the fringe of the European Parliament to uh, the European Conservatives and Reformists, which still is seen as a, 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 as a group which do not question per se uh, the membership or sort of European project as such. Now, very briefly, because I have one minute left, <laughs> what does all that mean uh, for the makeup of the next European Parliament elections?
Well, first of all, it seems to me that next European Parliament will be much more fragmented. So, as I've already indicated, mainstream parties' uh, biggest blocs will lose uh, seats, um, Eurosceptics, but also other new political movements will gain them. We'll probably see something that uh, Simon Hicks, the LSE professor, coined as Dutchification of the European politics. If you're into the Dutch politics, you will see that there are 13 parties in the Dutch parliament and four are needed to form a coalition. I think there will be a similar trend in the next European parliament where you will need more uh, political groups to form a coalition. Now, what does it mean for the EU business? Well, that means that it will be much more difficult for the Commission and the Council to push EU legislation. It will require a, a very often difficult efforts to hammer the support across the political spectrum. Now, it will probably also make it easier, uh, may, may, make it more difficult uh, to install the next European Commission's president. Now, the polls suggest that the EPP will still be the biggest political family uh, after the elections, but uh, it might uh, find it very difficult to push the candidacy of its Spitzenkandidat, uh, Martin Weber, through the new uh, uh, European Parliament simply because it will need the support across the political uh, spectrum, and I can't see at least liberals voting today for Man Manfred Weber, keeping in mind also his constraints about rule of law in, in Hungary, but I'm sure we can come back to that later. Um, and just to, to finish off, um, what we will see probably, um, uh, or some, some would say finally, is a departure from traditional voting blocs into more ad hoc coalitions across the European, uh, across the European uh, political spectrum in the European Parliament. Uh, some would actually argue that this is a good thing because they will say greater political competition on the EU level is something that attracts public interest. I mean, many people, including me, actually criticize the Spitzenkandidaten system also because of that, that the candidates of the main political groups very often do not have different views on, on individual policies, so why bother to put them on the stand uh, so that they can debate? Um, uh, but at the same time, you will hear others saying, well, hang on a second, the fact that the parliament will be more fragmented will be a huge challenge to the smooth functioning of the European decision-making process, and it will create an incentive for member states to actually bypass the European parliament and perhaps strike some deals outside the EU institutional framework. Now, just to, the, the, the final point I wanted to make is, you might remember the European Parliament launched its 2014 elections with a theme, this time is different. Well, at that time, actually, traditional blocs held up. But I think it is right to say that definitely this time, this time uh, will be different, and I will leave it with that. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for the invitation and uh, to this very interesting uh, discussion. It's my first time at the uh, annual FIAR Day, uh, mm -hmm. but uh, Teja is a regular guest at our annual CFSP conference <laughs> in, in Berlin, so I'm, I'm very happy to exchange the favor uh, and speak for the first time today here at this event. And uh, I'm very tempted to directly comment both on Spitzenkandidaten uh, and the ideas uh, proposed for, for the UK after Brexit, but I will try to limit my, uh, my my first input to what I was asked to speak about, which is to give a, a more in-depth look at the EU skeptic forces uh, in the European Parliament elections uh, and how that could impact the political system of the European Union after, after the election. And it's, I think, for me very interesting to see that uh, within EU circles, uh, this election has already been 
brought up, as Agatha uh, said, as a decisive election. At least in Berlin, you already get invitations to these events, which are either called Europe at Crossroads or Europe Quo Vadis, uh, where this impression, this is really the election to decide about the fate uh, of the European Union. But whereas if you look outside of the close EU circles, at least the feeling for me in, in Berlin is that it's still very much about a national election, about national, national topics. And what I want to run you through uh, in my 10 to 15 minutes is to have a look really into um, three, three separate questions. Uh, the first question is how well are EU skeptic forces uh, expected to do in the, Europe election, in the European elections? The second very much connected question is will they be able to form a joint group in the European Parliament? And thirdly, what will that mean for for the political system um, of, the, of the EU. And so the first question uh, concerns this, uh, this notion is, are we, are we heading for a new wave of Euroscepticism uh, after, uh, after the European elections? And you can already see that in, in, in some projections. Uh, there are even articles claiming we can look at uh, over a third of MEPs uh, to come from, from Eurosceptic uh, forces. Agata mentioned the, the number 20, uh, 28%. But I'm personally uh, a little bit more, uh, let's say, conservative of, of my uh, estimation, and I give you three reasons uh, for that. And the first is that I think we need to be careful in our definition on who we put into the camp of Eurosceptic forces. And for me, uh, we should only put political parties there, which either want to reduce European integration solely to the intergover intergovernmental level, or get rid of the European Union um, altogether. And I think this is important to not make the mistake to put every political party that criticizes policies on the European level directly into the camp of Eurosceptic or anti-European forces. I think if we do that, we create a situation where we only, from a Brussels perspective, uh, allow parties that are committed Europeans to, be, to uh, take part in the political legitimate debate and brand everyone else as Euroskeptic. And I think if we limit ourselves to that definition of Euroskepticism, we currently uh, look around either uh, around to uh, 18 to 20 percent in the current European Parliament, which focus on the intergovernmental EU or withdrawing from the European uh, Union um, altogether. So who I personally, for instance, wouldn't put in the Eurosceptic uh, camp are parties from the European left, which are very critical of Eurozone policies, very critical of austerity policies in their countries, but not as such are critical um, or reject European integration uh, as such. My second reason uh, why I'm more conservative in my estimates is uh, that, yes, it's true that EU skeptic parties have gained in almost all national elections since 2014, but I think that was more foreshadowed by the 2014 elections uh, themselves. So if we look at the individual country levels, in a lot of countries, EU skeptic forces are now either at the level they were in 2014 in the European Parliament elections, or sometimes even below that in countries, for instance, uh, like the Netherlands, uh, in countries like France. Uh, and there only, if I look at the individual numbers, four countries where I expect a, a, a a substantial increase in Eurosceptic forces, which is Sweden, where the Sweden Democrats were quite small in the European Parliament elections in 2014. Spain with Vox, we're unsure how big they are going to be. Germany with the Alternative for Deutschland, certainly gaining more than 7% than they did in 2014. And of course, the big one is Italy with Lager uh, having a chance to be even the biggest national party in the European Parliament. So I think it's only these four countries where I expect a huge substantial country-wise increase, but overall um, less compared uh, to 2014 as this then was already foreshadowed. And the third reason is Brexit. Of course, we heard before, uh, we don't know whether the UK will participate in the European Parliament elections. My assumption is still that they will not participate in the elections themselves. And this will mean that the biggest group of EU skeptic parliamentarians that there are so far in the European Parliament will have to leave uh, the Parliament. And so if we look, put all these three uh, together, my estimation uh, is actually that 
uh, despite the development we've seen over the last years, that the number of uh, MEPs from uh, fundamentally EU skeptic parties uh, will not increase substantially, and we're still looking at a number of around 20 to 22 uh, percent uh, overall. Which brings me to my second question. I think this is the more crucial one for the European Parliament, is will they be able to work together? So just as a reminder how the situation is today, uh, as I said, we already have around 20 percent of EU skeptic um, parliamentarians in the European Parliament, but they are fragmented into three different groups, um, both because they're divided on how fundamentally EU skeptic they are and, and uh, on other policy issues, but also on, under, I would say, the inherent differences of nationalists working together uh, on a European scene, where they're uh, separated into three different groups the more moderate Euro, uh, European conservative and reformist group, the ECR, um, which doesn't participate in the major votes in the European Parliament, but it's sometimes constructive, for instance, on economic uh, issues. And uh, the Finns party from Finland, uh, this is the political group uh, where they sit in, in the European Parliament. And then we have the Europe of freedom and direct democracy of UKIP and the Five Star Movement of Italy, uh, and finally the Europe of nation and freedom, uh, where, for instance, Le, Le Pen, the FPÖ, uh, Wilders uh, Party, and so on uh, sit, sit together. And so, uh, even though they uh, sit at almost 20%, they have almost no influence in the European Parliament, they are very fragmented. Even the three groups in themselves are very fragmented, um, and they're also the least active parliamentarians uh, in the European Parliament. But um, as we've all seen by the media campaigns and reports about Steve Bannon wanting to write in like the American Knight to unite the Eurosceptic forces in the European Parliament, but also about Salvini wanting to create a joint European uh, group, uh, having his talk with Kaczynski, with Orban, and so on, there is the ambition after the European election to, for, for the first time, create a joint group uh, in the European Parliament. And in sheer numbers, if we think about such a group that could extend uh, from Viktor Orban's Fidesz, so currently a member of the EPP, over the current ECR, the EFDD, the ENF, if we put all of them together, uh, they would certainly be above 20% and could challenge the European People's Party uh, for uh, the role of the biggest faction uh, in, in, the, in the European uh, Parliament. So I think uh, we have to look, if we're looking at the, uh, the, the, the shape of the Eurosceptic uh, sphere after the next European election, we have to look at three, uh, three different scenarios. The first scenario is a um, continuation of the status quo, where we would still have three different Eurosceptic political groups in the European Parliament. I think we can already count that out. The EFDD is imploding by UKIP leaving the European Parliament, Nigel Farage having left UKIP itself, and the Five Star Movement from Italy has already also declared that they want to create their own new group in the European Parliament. So I think we can rule out the status quo um, as something that is not going to happen after, after the election. So the second scenario, and this is for me still the most likely scenario, is a split of the Eurosceptic camp in, in three distinct camps, where we have still the ECR, the more moderate <coughs> national conserv conservative Eurosceptics led by the Polish Peace Party, certainly more Central European than, than they are now, um, who will still play to some extent that role where they are not fundamentally Eurosceptics, they will not cooperate on the major votes, for instance, on the European Commission, but cooperate on issues like uh, economic questions, single market, uh, and so on. And then on the other hand, the more radical ENF composed uh, by everyone um, on the more hardcore Eurosceptic uh, fundamental right, uh, like uh, the Lega from Italy, the AfD from Germany, um, and so on. Um, and I think this is, for, and from my perspective, the most likely scenario because the political differences between these groups are really, are really still, uh, still strong enough. And the third scenario um, would be that uh, where the, the, these two blocks actually manage, manage to, to unite and to form this one big uh, Eurosceptic uh, group, which I personally uh, still think is going to fail uh, due to the personal differences of these leaders and to, uh, to the policy differences on how to treat Russia, on how to treat the future of the European Union, how to treat migrants, uh, whether there's 
less need for solidarity from those from the south or uh, the need for more pushback from the, from those uh, from the center. Um, but I think there there are two factors uh, that could really that could really influence uh, uh, to bring about this this group. And the first of these factors is what happens with Fidesz um, in in the European People's Party, where. Um, when I wrote my report on this, uh, which is still in, in, in our editing process uh, in, in Berlin, I still wrote it as a remote possibility that the EPP would try to push out uh, Fidesz, uh, but after, after uh, Orban is basically uh, asking the EPP uh, to take more hard measures uh, by directly attacking the EPP commission president and making it so visible to the rest of Europe that he has left the value base and the political space of the European political party. I think this will be one essential factor if the EPP pushes out Orban and Fidesz, uh, that will be the incentive uh, for his party to try uh, to work much stronger together to become a leader of Eurosceptic forces. And then I think there is an incentive and a moment for the other Eurosceptic parties uh, to, to, to rally uh, around that. And the second, the second major factor, I think, is Salvini himself. How, how much and in how far he will be able to make a deal with the Polish peace. Uh, to work together uh, after the European election. I think if those two, uh, basically if those three parties come together, Fidesz, Peace, and the Lega of Italy, and say we want to, want to form a joint Euro Eurosceptic group in the European Parliament, despite our all internal political differences, that could be the decisive factor uh, to bring about uh, such a big group. But as I said, I'm personally still leaning to the scenario B of the two major groups competing at each other, but I wouldn't count out that scenario of a joint major EU skeptic group. Which, of course, brings us to, to the third question, uh, how much will that influence policymaking uh, on the European level if we suddenly have uh, even such a, a huge group in the European uh, Parliament? So first, um, I think to be perfectly honest, it will mostly be a sim symbolic damage to the European Union. As long as they are not close to the overall majority in the European Parliament, I think uh, the, the parties of the center will still be forced uh, to work together uh, to, for, uh, to elect a commission president and find majorities there. And unlike on the national level, I think the willingness of center-right parties to rather orient it towards the center than work together with hard EU skeptic forces is so strong that I believe that they will not have a huge impact on policy making in the European Parliament uh, itself. Secondly, however, they will force this overall super grand coalition in the European Parliament. Agatha already alluded to that. The two major parties are expected to lose their overall majority so that we will then have three groups in the center having to find a majority. So the, uh, the People's Party, the European Socialist, and most likely the Liberals. So all the center parties on the European level will have to work together to find majorities, uh, which is workable, but will erode the differences between the center parties uh, even further, uh, and therefore make it more difficult for citizens to distinguish between the different center parties if they all have to work together on, on the European level. Third, they will certainly gain more lower level influence. So especially if there is such a, a huge one uh, EU skeptic group in the European Parliament, they will of course have claim to committee chairs, to rapporteur positions, to shadow rapporteurs. So all these lower level positions in Brussels and Strasbourg, uh, which will force them for the first time into a more constructive position. They will have to make, uh, have to participate much more actively in lawmaking, but of course they will also have more, more influence uh, for the first time. And then uh, the force, uh, I think this will be the more, most interesting uh, effect. Uh, I'm one of the more positive proponents on the Spitzenkandidaten principle, and I think the Spitzenkandidaten principle will really put a highlight on how European parties deal with Eurosceptic parties. Uh, and I think for Manfred Weber, if the European People's Party, as we expect, becomes the largest party and therefore wants to claim, wants to claim the position as commission president, 
the Spitzenkandidaten principle will force Manfred Weber to make a choice on Orban. I cannot expect the others, the Liberals and the Socialists, to elect an EPP Commission President as long as Viktor Orban is still a member of the European People's Party. And therefore, I think the, the Spitzenkandidaten principle, if not before the election, after the election will force the EPP to make a decision on how to deal with Fidesz. And I think this will be a crucial factor in how the next commission will be made up. And therefore, this will really enter the, uh, the, uh, the struggle about the control of uh, the next uh, commission. And then, fifth, I want to f uh, end with, with one sobering thought, uh, which is, I think, for all the attention on the European Parliament, I think the biggest impact that EU skeptic parties so far had are not through the European Parliament, but through the Council, uh, where they are now either a member or, uh, or leading several EU national governments. So I think we should not focus all our attention on what Eurosceptic parties do in the European Parliament, but rather look at the broader picture. After the European elections, uh, they will also have laid claim to, um, to nominate several commissioners. They will be there at the table through uh, the Council. So I think the European Parliament is only one piece of the puzzles on how they want to shape, shape the future of the European Union. And here, uh, and with this, I want to end. The one lesson for me from Brexit is that EU skeptic parties have learned to move away, for, a very, for very few exceptions, to move away from questioning the membership of the Euro European Union to want to change the fundamental values of the European Union. And here, I think this is uh, the real struggle where not only the European elections, but the formation of the next uh, commission and the next strategic agenda will decide how much influence uh, EU skeptic forces have on the direction of the EU overall. Thank you very much.